Hi, I'm your host, Vasco Duart. Welcome to the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast, where we share tips and tricks from Scrum Masters around the world. Every day, we bring you inspiring answers to important questions that all Scrum Masters face day after day. Hello, everybody. Welcome to one more week of the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast. And uh, this week, uh, joining us from the USA is Mike Lyons. Hey, Mike, welcome to the show. Hi, great to be here. Thanks so much for the opportunity. Absolutely. So Mike, reading the Agile Manifesto in 2006, decided to focus on making teams and organizations more adaptive and efficient. And despite facing failures and mistakes, I'm sure we'll hear more about that in this week's episodes, these experiences provided him with a valuable lesson or lessons that enhanced his ability to achieve result, uh, tangible results with Agile. Now, Mike, that was a short intro. Tell us a little bit more about yourself and how did you end up becoming a Scrum Master? Yeah, thanks. I, well, you know, in 2006, like you just mentioned, uh, I was working on a, a large scale, you know, multi-year, uh, many millions of dollars uh, project, traditionally trained PMI, you know, I, I didn't have my PMP yet, but uh, it was it was a traditional uh, project, you know. Not, not my first one. I'd been in the industry for quite a while. I've been in IT my whole career. But um, but I, I remember this particular one, uh, Vasco. I remember this particular project because it really stood out to me. We, we were in like month three of, of requirements gathering. You, you'll remember this. The users shall select the system's uh, button to choose their county. It was a, a elections system. Anyway. And then we would argue about the word select for 20 minutes. You can't say select because they might click. Well, what if they use the keyboard and hit enter? Okay, if the user selects enter. And, you know, 30 minutes later, you're arguing. And I just was ah, just sort of exhausted. And I went for a walk. I went up to the fourth floor and uh, where the IT department was. And, and uh, there was a conference room and posted on the wall was this Agile Manifesto. I'd never seen it before, but... I remember reading it, you know, these four simple values. And, and it was like a, a physical relief. Uh, I remember like a, like a, like a, this is easier. <laughs> this is better. <laughs> and it, this can is be, more, it can be easier and better for sure. More natural, maybe. Maybe it's not easier. Maybe that's, I need to think about that. Because it's maybe it's not easier. But, well, I, I don't but, know if it is easier or not. That is a yeah. good point. But it definitely can be better. I think so. And it resonated deeply with me. And it was sort of, as you know, you read in the bio, sort of started this journey. And and one of the first things I did was, was, was get some training. Because I'm like, well, what is this thing? And I discovered the Certified Scrum Master, you know, the Scrum Alliance certified scrum master and oh my gosh it's been a while now but um uh, and then from there just continued to 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 learn and grow and actually left that project <laughs> and i had sort of made a pact with myself is that i don't i don't want to do it this this traditional way i want to i want to do things differently and and i've been i've been just so fortunate so blessed to be able to have, have been able to be in the agile delivery space now since then um but that that's what started and that's how I my my first role became a I became a scrum master. I, I guess technically I went from business analyst to scrum master was kind of the transition, you know. Business analyst coming off of that project I just described, go to the certified scrum master training, still don't know much, but I know a little bit, and then jumped in and and partnered with an existing scrum master. His name remember, his name was Tim and and he's the one that kind of like mentored me. And and let me try some things out, you know, and that's how I started. It was in a small uh, IT shop working uh, here in the U.S. We we have different counties within our states, and those county governments. I worked in the county government, and that's where I started. And that's such an important process that uh, trying things out as we get. But of course, 
when we try things out, sometimes they don't work as we want them to work. And that's really the story we're going to explore today uh, here on the Monday episode, Mike. So share a story with us of that moment, the moment where you as a Scrum Master, you tried your best, but as it so often happens, that just wasn't good enough at the time. And of course, we'll dive into the lessons learned and what we can do differently ourselves. But tell us that story first, Mike. You know, uh, at the same same program I was just describing there, uh, we were probably I was I was probably you know maybe half a year into my new Scrum Master, so so six months in, and we were in a sprint planning session, uh, and I can remember there was a a, a need for uh, this uh, adding a, a, a pick list item to a to a drop down menu. I forget what the item was, but it was something kind of everybody knew. What I think we were adding in a, a new county that had been established or something. And uh, I remember in sprint planning, my newly minted Scrum Master, six months in, uh, we were using user stories. Now, I know user stories are not part of Scrum, but but we were using user stories. And so I said, okay, well, how are we going to write this? As a, a user of the system, I want to add this new value to the dropdown so that I can select it and then be more efficient in my ability to select. Uh, and I remember the developer, uh, his name's Quentin, he looked at me and he said, I'm not writing all that crap down. <laughs> I thought, you're, what do you mean you're not writing it down? We do user stories. This is how we do it. And I was, al I was like almost offended, you know. But but he said we're not writing all that down. Look, I I just know we're going to add in this Gilpin was the answer. Gilpin, I'm just going to I don't need a user story for that. And I just remember it being this moment of, oh, okay, you know, I, I don't need to be, uh, what is the word? Maybe prescriptive. And this is how the book says to write user stories. Again, I know user stories are not part of Scrum, but we were using that method. Uh, <laughs> and it was a turning point for me, much like reading the Agile Manifesto was a turning point for me. This idea of the Scrum Master needs to show up and tell everybody exactly how to do things. Boy, that's that didn't work too well. And so, you know, you mentioned the lessons, like what do we learn from that as Scrum Masters? Uh, we learn uh, you don't have to tell people what to do. In fact, that you know, it doesn't the the by the book or the the prescription doesn't doesn't always doesn't always work. So the lesson I learned, of course, is that one, but also to listen to those who are doing the work. In this case, this software developer, his name's Quentin. He was told me, you know, I'm not writing all that crap. <laughs> <laughs> and guess what? It's okay. And what I realized there was, you know, our, our sprint planning is about shared understanding, isn't it? It's about getting to shared understanding and committing uh, committing as a team to, to to delivering in the next, you know, in this two week sprint cycle. In that case, big big lesson. I remember that one. Yeah, and and such a great story because it does highlight one mm. aspect of the sprint planning that doesn't often come up, which is this idea that the goal is not to get all the stories accepted for the sprint. Oh. The goal is not to get all the details clarified for every story. The goal is not to get the, every story estimated story points, t-shirt size, or whatever estimation. The goal is to get to that shared understanding of what are we going to try to do in the next, hopefully, week to two weeks. And that shared understanding doesn't have a form, or I should say, doesn't have a mandatory form. It does have a form, and it must have a form. But of course, the form needs to be defined by those who do the work. And I think that's yeah. a key lesson that you just... Uh, highlighted that those who do the work should be the ones deciding how the work gets to be done. Uh, and this is a lesson I learned many years ago, even before I knew about Scrum with the whole Toyota production system mm. and how they involve the workers in the, the improvement of the um, process, right? They collect every year, they collect hundreds, if not thousands of process improvement ideas, and they implement the vast majority of them because they are ideas that are both uh, submitted or proposed as well as implemented by the people who do the work. Exactly. Yeah. I, I, I like to also add to that, that I think for scrum masters, um, but really anybody that wants to be in this sort of agile delivery space, there's a bit of like intellectual humility that needs to enter in this idea that, 
I, I, I don't, I'm definitely not the smartest person in the room. <laughs> I'm just like, let's start there. But also, I mean, the people who are closest to the work, as you shared in the TPS example, they have great ideas. They're the smart ones. They're the ones that are close. They're the, they're going to have the innovative, uh, you know, solutions and best ways to do it. Also because they it, have to, it's their work. They have to face it right. every single day. Isn't that right? Yeah. And so maybe what, you know, to further that lesson, just to think more, even I'm sort of learning as we're talking is, you know, part of our job is to make sure to give them the the space and the freedom and the protections to to do their best work. I think this idea of being a, a leader, a, a servant leader, and I know, you know, in the scrum guides, we took, we took the word servant leader out, but it still is part of our, I think our makeup is, you know, let's let's make sure we're doing our best to to get get people to where they're doing their best work, and that might mean that we're removing an impediment, or you know, we're mediating a policy, we're we're meeting with <clears throat> taking a leadership role and meeting with the right executives to say, gosh, are we sure that the change advisory board is is necessary? It really slows us down when they only meet every two weeks, and you know, our sprints now we we have to we have to get our work done, and then we lose a whole sprint while we wait for this group of people to meet and talk about it. They've never they're not on our team. They're not close to the work. They're further. And they probably than want I am. to write that like, in the form of a user story, even when it doesn't need to. That idea, is, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? As a scrum master, I'm going to meet with the. No, I don't. Know. It's like <laughs> don't do it. Just don't do it. It's a great story. Thank you for sharing, Mike. <laughs> sure thing. Monday is about what we learn from our obstacles and our failures. But tomorrow is Team Tuesday here on the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast. We explore teams and their journeys, the habits they develop that threaten their performance, how each of our guests help their teams evolve, and the one key lesson they learned from that experience. We really hope you liked our show. And if you did, why not rate this podcast on Stitcher or iTunes? Share this podcast and let other Scrum Masters know about this valuable resource for their work. Remember that sharing is caring.